kind of hesitate to ask this next question, but I'm going to ask it anyway and, and risk, risk the wrath. But Richmond was exciting in 2001, but then Richmond, again, the next year was exciting, but probably not the way that you might have liked after Ricky and one of your crew guys got into some kind of dispute. And I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. <clears throat> what happened? I, I was um, – I was witness to none of it. Um, obviously, I was in on the meetings <laughs> post. Yeah, yeah. But it was um, – when you're racing, you're always trying things. You're trying to get better. And let's see, where did Richmond fall? It would have been September. Okay. So, it was – that was September of 02? 02, yes, sir. So it was near the end, as I call it. So, September. I think I had already told Robert. I don't know if I told Robert I was leaving yet or not. But there was, there was tensions with Ricky and Robert on their negotiations to extend the contracts. And I really, I'm not trying to make anybody look bad, but Ricky always had um, these theories that someone was against him, out to get him, that type of mentality. You know, yeah. everybody's, everybody's different. Yeah. Um, and so he was convinced prior to that that we weren't getting as good of motors. And um, 88 was getting better stuff and more durable stuff. He was convinced in 01, let's see, 02. He was convinced at 01 that we got an experimental motor at Martinsville. That's why it blew up. And that's when we lost we were second to points. And that's when we lost our shot championship because we blew a motor and fell out early. And Gordon finished. All he, all he had to do was finish in. Yeah. Um, and we lost our shot at points. But he, he couldn't get that out of his mind. And so one of the things you learn as a crew chief that you didn't know when you first went in this business was it's, it's a lot mental from a driver. A driver has to believe in his car, believe in his crew, believe in the motor. And when he gets all that, then he'll be good. The good ones. Ricky was that way. Even Morgan was that way. Uh, I, I mean, I even seen touches of it with Rich Bickle and everybody. Yeah. But when Ricky got out of that mentality, he was the Ricky that everybody said he was. When he believed in everything, he was the Ricky I knew he was. And he had got back to the Ricky that other people said he was. And so he was complaining about the motor on uh, on the radio throughout the race. Well, then this guy. So when he gets out of the car, it's hot. He's sweating. The last thing he wants to do is talk to a reporter, number one. But for sure what he don't want to talk to is somebody that's had a couple beers that's mouthy, right? And so this this guy who worked in the motor shop met him as Ricky was going back to the hauler and uh, basically started an argument. And Ricky turned and walked away, and the guy threw a – actually a water bottle is what hit him. Threw a water bottle and hit him. In the eye, and uh, so it wasn't a punch. It was a water. No, it was really? a cap. It was a cap on a Dasani water bottle. So we make sure we were coke, but yeah, a Dasani, <laughs> a Dasani yeah, water bottle. Yeah, yeah. Wow, where the guy threw okay. it. Yeah, but I mean, you know, it'd be like a rock. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the cap hit him in the eye. It wasn't a punch. Okay, all right. Yeah, but it should have never happened. Right, you know, right. uh, you know. 
you you mentioned the fact that you had already talked to Robert. You might have already I'm not talked sure. to Robert yeah. about going over to Gibbs or whatever. But evidently, you signed a you signed an extension with Robert, and evidently you were going to go work for uh, work with Elliot Sadler in 2003. But then all of a sudden, at the <clears> end of the season, you're at Joe Gibbs Race. So I had to sign an extension with Robert. Yeah. And Ricky. Right. I'll emphasize that. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. I didn't know Elliot. Okay. Right. I didn't know nothing about him. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd seen him in the garage and all that like that, and then I had a couple beers with him trying to get to know him or whatever. But I didn't know what his skills were. Um, but at the same time, I got contacted from Gibbs, from some of his people. And... Like I told you before, I had I had created a pathway and I was moving and I was trying to improve all the way. Well, to start with, I didn't, I wasn't sure we were going to improve at Yates. I didn't know if we were going to get better or worse, but I wasn't sure we were going to get better. Um, I want to win a championship. I want to be a part of a championship team. Um. So, and it actually happened before the end of the season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, I was a poor old country boy from Lattimore, North Carolina. Let's remember that. And they they talked to me about some things that I would have never dreamed. Could Joe have Gibbs. Happened. Joe Gibbs is great. Okay, right. Um, and it just, I mean, I was like, whoa, you know. I knew there was an opportunity to win a championship. They had won one a couple years before. Um, they obviously had the pieces, the finances. Um, and so, you know, I got to get out of my contract. And they said, well, we'll take care of that. Whatever it costs, we'll, we'll handle it. We, wow. just, we need you. Okay. And so, when I approached Robert about it, um, it probably didn't go that good you know I mean we weren't going to fight or nothing like that but um, but it was hard it'd be like telling your dad you know that because I had a, I had more respect for Robert probably than anybody I ever worked for um, it'd be like telling your dad you, you know how you, or if you go tell your dad something that you know he's going to be disappointed in, but you got to go tell him. And that's kind of how that meeting was. Is I knew, I felt like I knew in my heart it was the right move. I also knew that Robert was going to be mad. And, and Robert didn't get mad like throwing stuff, fighting. He, he, so it made you feel disappointed. And you knew, I'm like, Robert's going to be disappointed, man. He's going to be pissed. And so I had a couple meetings with him and um, you know, I don't have anything against Elliot, but I just didn't think it was the right move for me. And he, he got mad at me. I don't know that he's ever talked to me since Elliot Sadler. Yeah. Uh, but um, he had some semi success at Yates, but I just didn't think it was my deal, what I needed to do. So um, me and Robert started talking or whatever and then um, Zippy says well if they tell you to leave come on and go to work and you can help me try to finish winning this championship right and so I'm like what do you mean he said just wait <laughs> and see what happens so the, that was on a Monday when I had to meet with Robert and I think on Wednesday he said, uh, "We're gonna go in a different direction. We don't, we don't need you to go to whatever the next race was." Wow! And so I went with Gibbs now, and I went over there and I started hanging out, hung out with Bobby and Jimmy, and and during that time, we were doing some. Uh, we we would do testing during the race. 
on things like air pressure and stuff like that that would help the 20 because they were trying to win a championship. I think they were going against Mark, actually. Uh, I think that's the one where Mark got penalized at, at Rockingham that cost him the championship on the intake or something like that. Anyway, so we were working, I was working with the 88, I mean the 18 and the 20. I was signed to the 18, I mean I was signed to the 20. But we were doing, I was working on the 18 to help the 20. So this was my first real experience at teammates. Same building, same cars. We're on the radio together. We're talking to each other. We're helping each other. And, you know, we would learn some stuff on tire pressure and we'd get out and tell them and then all of a sudden they'd get better, you know, and, and, and we helped them. And they were great. Don't get me wrong. I, I didn't go over there and help them win a championship, but I was a part of it, you know. And, and you know, I got to be a part of it, you know. So that's my only, you know, part of being on a championship team was that. You know, I got – but I felt like I was part of it. So – and then we started doing some testing with the 18. But it was cool, man, to be in an organization like that and see how it was really supposed to work. Um, at Yates, there were, were, it was teams, but they were they worked individually. Yeah. And over there, it was teams that worked as a team. Uh, but it was interesting, uh, to say the least. You had a pretty good year with Bobby – in 2003, I think you got a couple of wins. Yep. Were you, were you satisfied at that point? I felt like for for a um, first year, um, we won Atlanta. We sat on a pole at Texas. I don't know, I might have had another pole or two. I don't remember. Um, <clears throat> I learned some things about Bobby. We had a shot to win a few races. Finishing second or third, um, and then this is my mark on time. We won the last ever Winston Cup race at Homestead. Okay, yeah. Um, you know, Bill led most of the race, and we were in second or third most of the race, and then he had a flat coming off of two. Bobby had just said the lap before. I ain't never going to catch him. He's playing with us. And I said, hammer down, man. You don't know what's going to happen. And by that time, he had a flat. Yeah. And we drove around and we won. Um, so I was part of the, winning the last ever Winston Cup race. Um, so we had a pretty good year. I don't know where we finished in points, but um, it, it was a good season. Uh, and then we started the next season. Uh, with high hopes, obviously. You're going to make me ask, aren't you? <laughs> um, 2004, whatever happens, happens. And when you and I first started texting back and forth and sending messages back and forth, one of the first things that you said was, I'll tell you what happened at Gibbs. I'll tell you the real story of what happened. All right, so it, it's go time. <laughs> <laughs> what what happened? So, as we discussed in the prior hour and whatever we've been talking, um, most of my life I have not been what you'd say politically correct. Yeah. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. It, it is what it is. Um, I would do. I'm like everybody else who's 50 years old. There is definitely some things I would have done differently as I came up through my life. But I can't go back and fix them. I can just try to be better for it. But my whole life, from the time I was, when I went in the sixth grade, we won the Pee Wee football championship in overtime. We beat the team we'd never beat our whole life. From that point forward, I had won at everything I had done somehow. Figured out a way to win. If we was hurt, we played. Uh, we figured out a way to win racing. We figured out a way to win in football. We figured out a way to win in wrestling. Whatever I did, I tried to figure out a way to win. And I thought that when you raced, 
you raced to win. That's what you did. No matter what you had to do to get there, you raced to win. And it was that way at Roberts. We did what we had to do to win. I told you earlier, we cut a whole body off the day before. When I first went to Gibbs, I thought it would be the same way. Joe being from the football world, um, the success they had had. Zippy seemed to be that way. But what I learned when I was there that second year, also changed me as a person because I learned that it wasn't just about racing. In the blink of an eye, I learned it wasn't just about racing. It was about being politically correct and racing. And the politically correct was sometimes before the race and me I had always been whatever I had to do to win a race or have a chance to win the race is what I did well <clears throat> that was the first year of the new point system I think you can look I think we were fifth or something when I when I left um, but we had run good all year we saw a pole again at Texas um, and we'd had some top fives and top tens, and we'd ran fairly, fairly, fairly successful. But we hadn't won. Um, and I was pushing, and I was pushing hard, and I was pushing the guys hard. And we had a little guy um, who worked on our team little weasel of a guy who uh, come to find out was uh, <clears throat> he was Bobby's little guy he was doing some things behind my back for Bobby and telling Bobby some things behind my back that I didn't want that Bobby didn't necessarily need to know because sometimes you do things on cars that might be a little discretionary <laughs> that the whole world don't need to know. And the drivers talk a lot, so we don't always tell them when we're doing some things. Not unsafe, but maybe on the gray area with NASCAR. So this guy, we caught this guy doing this, me and my crew. And so we had a little situation at Pocono and uh, involved this kid and I, uh, Basically, I wanted him fired because I didn't trust him. He was he was he was a detrimental to the team. Well, Bobby wasn't Bobby didn't want no part of it, and this went on for a couple of weeks. And then um, our tensions grew stronger and stronger between me and Bobby. And I don't remember what race it was, but we um, we finished second again. And then Bobby came. Me and Bobby and Jimmy, we met, and Bobby was like, um, you know, we ain't winning a race, we ain't winning a race. And then I'm like, you know, well, you know, you don't have to finish second all the time, Bobby. You know, that so much has got a bumper on it. You don't have to wreck the guy, but, you know, there comes a point where you got to do your part, too. I can't build a car that's two seconds faster than everybody every week. You know, and at that time, it had already got to the point where everybody's cars were getting closer and closer together, and the templates were getting tighter and tighter. And it was hard to make big advantages, you know. And we started pushing each other and pushing each other, and um, you know, you started pushing each other just harder and harder. You know, are, are you he talking about a confrontation? No, 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 no oh, not okay, physically, okay, okay, not right, physically, okay, okay, right, okay. but you know. Basically, he ain't doing his job, and he ain't doing his job. And I'm saying he ain't doing his job. He's saying I ain't doing his job. And attention just got higher and higher and higher. But we were still running in the top tens every week. And like I say, I think we were fifth in points. And there was like six or seven races to go before the cutoff. And 
So irregardless, we weren't going out and eating dinner and drinking beer. We were doing our jobs uh, and getting it done. So we finished. We we went somewhere. I don't remember what my last race was, but we went somewhere and Bobby just destroyed the pit crew on the radio that Sunday. Just obliterated them. And I've already told you once how I'm about my guys. I mean, just, y'all suck. I can't believe we can't get in and out of here and just abuse them. So, this was probably my fault. But it was worth every damn penny of it. <laughs> That's not so, fu- Somebody no, losing his job is not funny. But I didn't care at that point. I was, <clears throat> I was way over it. Yeah. So, I don't remember the race. So, we got ready to go to the next race. And anytime we had a new car or something like that, he would come in the shop and uh, check the seat and fit the seat or whatever. So, I actually learned this from Harry Hyatt. So he was dead and gone then, but it was his fault. <laughs> um, he got in the car, put the steering wheel on, and he checked the belts and everything, got everything fixed. And he's and the guy who was doing the setup, uh, I think it was Scotty, uh, to he said, hey, come here, Bobby wants to talk to you. I'm like, oh, this will be freaking great. So I go over there and I walk to the setup plate, and I say, yeah, what's up? He said, there's two push-to-talk buttons on the steering wheel. I said, yeah. He says, want to back up or whatever? I said, well, <clears throat> that one there, that's the one that's always there. It's one that's been there forever. You use it, talk on the radio. I said, so if you got anything important to tell me about the car, something about the air pressure, what the tires are doing, any adjustment we need to make, you push that button and tell me, just like you always have. He said, cool. He said, what's that button for? I, he said, I said, if you got something stupid to tell me, like the pit crew sucks, or you're whining about something, you push that freaking button, and there can't no damn body hear you whine. And I turned around and went to my office. Needless to say, that didn't do a whole lot for the tensions, but it sure made me feel better. <clears throat> so, I don't think we did too good that weekend, I don't know, but we didn't win. Yeah. And, uh, that little kid was up to his, and I made him go sit in a truck. The kid who was sneaking around talking crap. And uh, I said, you just sit in the truck. Well, he said, what do you mean? I said, sit in the truck all weekend. Don't even come out. You can go. I don't care where you go. Just don't be in this garage here. And uh, it just went on and on. And that Monday, Jimmy said, uh, um, nobody knows this, but and J.D.'s dead and gone. He's the only one I told I wouldn't tell, so. Um, he said, let's meet up in uh, Joe's office. Joe wasn't there. Joe's playing football. And I still say to this day, if Joe would have been there, it would never had. I'd have never left. I'd have been there until I quit racing. So went up in Joe's office, had a big round table, and J.D. was on one side, and Jimmy was over here, and I was over here. And, um, Bobby wasn't there. He didn't have the guts. And Jimmy said, well, <clears throat> um, Bobby don't work with you no more. I said, what does that mean? He said, well, he doesn't want to work with you anymore. I said, so, this was my moment in time I was telling you about earlier. I said, so you're telling me that we're fifth in points and the reset's coming in like six races. And all we got to do is be above 12th. And we got a shot to win the Winston Cup Championship. I mean, the next Hell Cup championship. I said, and we're going to throw all that away because Bobby got his damn feelings hurt. And J.D. said, threw his hands up and said, well, he don't want to work with you anymore. And I said, well, you can tell him to kiss my ass and y'all figure out how you're going to pay the rest of my contract. I'm going to the house. And that's what I did. And, was, and that was the end of it. And they missed the. They missed. You had to finish twelfth. Yeah. And they missed the cutoff. And didn't make it to the points. 
and and, and it proved to me <clears throat> that we couldn't be professional and do our job. It's about somebody getting their feelings hurt. And it was all about that little kid. He was one of Bobby's little boys. Not not really, but not. Yeah, yeah I understand. And he got his feelings hurt over that, and he let that situation destroy our relationship and expose us. Yeah. And, you know, when we're in public, he pretends like there's no issues or whatever, but he didn't invite me to the Hall of Fame. And he got his last two wins with me. Did he? He didn't win again after he won Atlanta, and he won Homestead and never won another race. Wow. But he didn't invite me to the Hall of Fame. Now, Gibbs invited me to their party, yeah. but he didn't invite me. But that's all right. I didn't do it for him. So that happened, and I, I guess there was a, maybe a month or so between that and your next gig or whatever. Was there ever a point where you considered walking away and saying, you know what, I, I, I'm, I'm done with this. I, I don't need this. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Okay. So it was kind of the <laughs> – Funny enough, it was kind of the Days of Thunder story. Um, I live about five, eight miles from here. And uh, one of the guys that worked for me at the time, his mom was a, worked at a rental place, and I had rented me a bulldozer, and I was clearing this property and uh, picking up stump, I mean, digging up stumps and smoothing it out and making pasture and stuff like that. And... Um, I was doing interviews from the bulldozer and yeah, yeah. that whole week. And uh, Eddie Wood and Lynn Wood drives up on my property out in the middle of the pasture where I was digging on that bulldozer. And I thought, I knew who was driving there was Rudd. And so they wanted to talk. So, you know, I, I, and I told him the same thing. I said, you know, I, I got to, I don't know what I want to do. And the first thing is, is uh, me and Ricky got to talk because um, that thing didn't end real well. And I need to make sure that we're on the same page if we're going to do this thing again. And I went to, went to Ricky's office and, and we sat down and had lunch and BS for a little while. And, Figure we'd give another shot. And so we did. You ran the full season in 2005 with Ricky and the Wood Brothers, and but then he retired for the, the first time. And it broke my heart. Did it really? Well, I mean, that's why I went there. Yeah. So here we are again. Driver of the week or whatever, whoever's coming next, I don't know. You know, it just, um, it's just so important that you have a good driver. I, I feel sure most everybody up there, back then, most everybody there was a good driver, but not most all of them could communicate what they needed. And that was the difference, you know what I'm saying? And he was one of them who could communicate. And Bobby was too, when he was, when Bobby was in his racing mind and nothing else was involved, he was the same way. He was one of the greatest drivers I ever worked with. Can't take it away from him. Atlanta, places like that, Texas, he could do things with a race car. Most people can't. Uh, when he's mentally, when he wasn't there, he he, he was average at best. Uh, and Ricky was the same way. And so I knew, here we go. We got to not take nothing away from the guys I worked with afterwards. I just knew where they were in their careers. And I just knew... This is gonna suck, man. Yeah. And so, here's a back, a back behind the scenes story is, is, so I learned at Gibbs that it wasn't all about racing. So it changed my mentality a little bit, my approach. I went more business because I saw that that's what it was. So I had a meeting with, we'll call it a meeting with. 
this is another. This is a doo -doo -doo -doo, breaking news. Yeah. With Richard Childers and Jeff Burton at Richard Childers' office at the winery, and I had all intentions of going to work there after I found out Ricky was leaving. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And. <clears throat> Um, I went back to the shop. We were, Wood Brothers was at um, Tag Detractors. Not yet. I wasn't. Okay. We were in Rudd's building. Okay. Right. I mean, I'm sorry. Robert's building across from the motor shop. Okay. Which was Rudd's building, which was Yates building. La, 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 la. Yeah. Um, and I went back and I told Eddie Wood, I stand outside the building, and I said, Well, Ricky's leaving. I'm out. I can't. I don't want to do a rebuild. I don't have a heart to rebuild again. I want to win. And <clears throat> I knew that Burton was going to be a lot like Rudd and Bobby, where he was on the tail end, but he wasn't done yet. And I felt like it would be the same situation where I could go and we could win two or three races if I could figure out what he needed. And so I was, I, I was like, I got me another shot here. So this, and what I'm gonna tell you is, only time in my career I ever did it. So Eddie came back to me with Tad and said, and, and made me an offer I couldn't refuse, really. And the moral of that story is that's the only time in my career I ever took a job for the money instead of the performance. I didn't really care about the money. All Every other job I ever had, I did it because I knew I could win and had a better shot at winning. So did you have the... Did you have the gig with RCR and Burton? All I had, yeah, I told him. I told him I, I hadn't signed any paper. Right, right, right. But I had said, yeah, I'll do it. Let me go see if I can clean things up with Eddie. Okay. Because my contract with Eddie said that I had to be involved with selecting the driver. Because I knew what was going. I didn't know what was going to happen, but I was afraid what was going to happen. So I had to have some input with it. Yeah. And so there was a there were some fine lines there that was, I probably was going to be able to get out of the contract. Right. Um, I only had a year to go on it, and um, he, you know, I ain't gonna let you out. I said I don't think you got any choice, Rick, uh, Eddie, and this went on and on. But anyway, they came back to me, him and Tad, and offered me a new contract with a lot of money to basically oversee all of Tad's stuff and the Wood Brothers stuff okay. to all stay. Right. Yeah. So I kind of fell into that general manager slash crew chief slash whatever you want to call it role. And I made a lot of money. And it's the worst decision I ever made my whole career. Bar none. Not going to work for the Wood Brothers. The year before that, that was great. Being involved with being a general manager and being involved with Tag Checker. That was absolutely the worst um, decision I made in my entire career. Why is that? Um, just the way some things unfolded. Um, the way it, and as you can see, the Wood Brothers is not with them anymore because it all it all ended up clarifying itself, but. Um, I don't know. We talked about it earlier. It's just what racing's like now and what it was like then. Um, it's just dirty now. Racing's dirty. And people's in it for herself and making money. And it ain't about racing. It's about the show. And it was always about the show a little bit. Yeah. But we was racing too. Yeah. You know? At what point did you start thinking about walking away? Because I remember you and I talking. I want to say it was at Bristol. And you and I talked in the hauler, and, and you said that you were thinking about walking away 
that you were more than likely going to be walking away to concentrate on your family, basically. So I had my first, I had my wife had had our first child, yeah. my daughter, and she was pregnant with our second. And um, some things that happened with the race team. And I had had, I, I asked them to, I had a contract through 2010. <clears throat> and so I had them, um, our agreement to make everybody happy was, is it would end at the end of that year, 06. Yeah. So that we didn't get into a big nasty argument. So. I had been through what I went through at Gibbs, and I had been what I went through with Tad, and I saw the side of the industry I didn't like. My second son, my second child was being born. Um, the race that I was looking for wasn't there anymore. Um, I had just had enough. Uh, you know, I probably should have stayed a few more years. Um, but it was the industry was changing really fast at that point in 06 07 you know that's when it really yeah Earnhardt was gone um the leadership in NASCAR was was you know Helton was still there but um everything else was spinning and changing and they didn't know what direction they were going in and Brian for sure didn't know what direction he was going in and um, I knew what was going to happen with Tad and the Wood Brothers. Um, it was just it was a chore to go to work every day, and I wasn't racing. You know, I was businessing, yeah. for lack of a better term. And um, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know the next step, and so I felt like I prayed a lot and uh, cried a lot and. Didn't know what to do, so what I was looking for was gone, um, and so I, I just thought it was the right time. Once you got out of the sport, how big of an adjustment was it for you personally? Deep down inside, how much of an <clears throat> adjustment was it for you personally? Because I know what it was like for me when I got out of the sport, and it was tough. When I'm when I'm done adjusting, I'll answer that question. Okay. Because I ain't yet. Me and my wife, we started over. At the time, we had been married for, uh, so that was 06, so we had been married for seven years. Been together for, we were together five prior to getting married. Yeah. Um, we started all the way over. Because <laughs> yeah. she'd been running the house while I was gone. Right, yeah. And I'd been out making money, and I'd been running everything where I was. And so we, we had to, refine our boundaries um personally i've been lost ever since um i would trade nothing for i've not missed i might have missed one baseball game my son started playing when he was five he's 13. uh i probably only missed one soccer game my other son uh, he started when he was five and he's 11. my my daughter i'm i'm, I'm almost every gymnastics competition uh I didn't miss any of that stuff. I got to see her win for the first time, you know. Um, got to see my son's home run first time. My other son's goal. Uh, you couldn't give me a bag of money to trade that out of me. Uh, there's no no price, you know. And, and a lot of those guys never saw that. Jimmy Finney, he's one of the guys that helped coach me through that time um, when I was struggling. And, he missed a lot of his kids, and he kept telling me over and over, "Don't miss it." And um, but I—that's who I am. I'm a dad first, yeah. and a husband, um, and a Christian. But that's who I—that's what I did. This other stuff, I'm just doing it so I can be with my kids. I still—that is still what I do. I probably never get to do it again. Um, but I still, I've never found 
peace since I walked away. I, I'm going to tell you a story. All right. And I don't know that this will be on the show or whatever. Uh, this is this is Rick and Mike talking. Um, I, I struggled big time. I mean, I, I went to work for NASCAR. I was going to be the PR person for the Bush Series, and they doubled, pat back, they doubled my salary. And I was never comfortable in that position. My first reaction when I was let go was to thank the guy. Yeah. And I struggled. And I thought I was the most important person in the Bush Series. I thought the Bush Series revolved around me, and they raced the next weekend. And that was a shock. I, I'm ashamed to tell you how big a shock that was. No, you shouldn't be. I taught high school for a year and a half. So I went from going to Daytona for a week to coming up with lesson plans for 10th grade English. It took me about two weeks to figure out that I really missed journalism. And I had a chance to go back to work for NASCAR. I, I, I had a chance to, to get back into the sport. Uh, I think actually when you and I got back in touch, probably 2006, 2007, eight somewhere in there. And I was doing a lot of freelance for NASCAR.com. And they had a they had a gig come up full time. I'd be back on the road doing what I'd been doing and everything and it went to somebody else. And I'll tell you when we stopped recording how it went down, but um I got so frustrated after that happened. And there I was, I had traveled the circuit I had tr I had literally traveled the world I'd gone to the first exhibition race in Japan and there I was basically without a job I, I, I taught three semesters and figured I'd better get out before I dropped to have a heart attack and so I, I went full time freelance in June of 2006 and 2007 8 somewhere in there is when I was doing a lot of stuff for NASCAR.com and the full time gig that I had chased went to somebody else and Michael I, I went I got so frustrated that I, I, I made the mistake of saying in front of my wife and kids I said I used to be somebody and I, I mean, I, that was deep. I oh, mean, yeah. that came from a deep, dark place. <clears throat> and one of my, my wife and I have twin boys, and they were, that, that, that was 07, 08, they were, they were seven, they were six or seven. So they were still pretty young. But one of those boys heard me say that at six or seven. And... He crawled up in my lap, and he hugged me tight. Now, I'm not talking about a one-arm man hug. I'm talking about he hugged my neck. And he looked at me, and he said, you are somebody. You're my daddy. That's pretty good. Huh? And I mean, it was just like that that my entire perspective changed. And I mean, in that moment, it became okay for me not to work for Winston Cup scene. It became okay for me not to work in NASCAR anymore. In that moment, that's when I became Adam and Jesse's daddy. And I became Jeannie's husband. And it was a long time before I ever even thought about NASCAR. See, that's why I don't. I don't race. I don't yeah. go to race. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do very little of this. I a guy. I got an email. I got a Facebook message from a from a publisher, 
who was starting a series of books about NASCAR. And he wanted to know if I would be interested in writing a book about the 1992 Daytona, or 1992 Hooters 500. And I wrote that book, and it got me involved in the sport again, but not full time. I wasn't going to the races. I think I went to Charlotte and stuck around for maybe a couple of days just trying to line up interviews and everything. That led to another book. That led to me talking to Steve about, you know, doing the scene vault and preserving all the papers and getting them scanned and making them available online and all that. That led to me doing this podcast. And doing this podcast and doing the scene vault thing, that led to the the commemorative issue at Darlington. And Darlington, when I went to the race track that weekend, that was the first time that I had been to a race track in this is the first time I that is the first time I'd been to a race. I stayed for the Xfinity race and watched it from the press box. And that was the first time I had been actually seen a race since two thousand eight. And mm. I don't know what I would have done if Adam hadn't crawled up in my lap and yeah. said that. I mean that that was I think People, I think, especially for me, when I say that um, that's what I am, what I am, what I mean by that is, is I'm a competitor. Yeah. And I don't think the world I competed in could, I could, I don't think it ever exist again. Um, but I'm a, a, like you said, man, I'm a, I'm a pitcher, and a, and a goalie, and a car driver, yeah. and a. Buying a baseball bat, and I take my youngest to school every day. Um, that's what I do now. Yeah. I wouldn't trade it. There's no way, like I said before, you couldn't give me a big enough bag of money to undo any of that. Um, but if I sat here and said, I don't wish I could compete again, I'd be lying. I, I mean, I'm a competitor. I've been away my whole life, and... Uh, but I probably won't ever get to it again. But I wouldn't undo anything I did uh, throughout the years. I probably stepped on a few toes. I might would tell them people I'm sorry. Um, but I don't know what I would have done different. 